we want to make sure that if we're going to kind of take on a client that we want to make sure that um you know there's demand for what it is that they're they're selling um that there is you know they've, they've got a, a kind of a reasonable proposition right because again it's it's it is difficult i mean you know a lot of people go oh you know i'm, I'm going to do drop shipping i'm going to do you know buy some stuff from china and i want to kind of run it through google and whatever else and i just again i think i, I think you, you've got to look at it which whether you're buying traffic from google by from facebook anywhere right if you've got like a lousy product and a lousy website you're going to get poor results right i mean it's not facebook is and google are not a magic wand right you've got to have good 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 product good process good people good customer service right and if all of those things are in play right then i think you've got a, a, a reasonably good chance of succeeding Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me on another episode of The Robust Marketer. We have just had a brief hiatus uh, where we basically were just, uh, you know, shutting her down a little bit after running three events in three months over, uh, you know, December, January, or January, February, March. It was quite a slog. Uh, and it was uh, it was amazing to do our, our first two shows in the US, our first two sold out shows in the US. They were they were really big successes. Uh, from the attendee standpoint, from the from the exhibitor standpoint, uh, it was just fantastic. And and one of the really cool things that I got to do in uh, at these events is meet Jim Banks, who I'm going to get to in a minute here. I've got a, we've got a funny origin story for for how we met. Very typical marketing story, but just to kick things off here, I want to welcome everyone for coming on live. Uh, we're going to be fielding questions today about Google Ads. Um, and I'm basically starting. We're going to call this another season. This is another season of the Robust Marketer because we're going to start interviewing all of the speakers who we've selected for this summer's e-commerce or Facebook and e-commerce mastery live that's happening in Barcelona on July 10th and 11th. We've uh, hand selected another amazing group of speakers um, who are, who are going to be talking on a, a number of topics to help people with their Facebook ads and Google ads and uh, other sort of ad buying platforms, other e-commerce strategies. Uh, and we're kicking it off with one of our headliners this week. So I was literally in the chandelier bar in Las Vegas. Uh, I think this was before the Las Vegas show. This was last year. Uh, and I was just literally lamenting. I was like, okay, we've had a bunch of people talk about how they really would like some Google ads content. I, th I think I was there with maybe Tim Bird or someone usually at the chandelier bar and with Tim Bird. And they said, and you just happened to be there basically. And they're like, well, this guy knows something about, about Google ads. Uh, and we met there. So welcome to the program, Jim. Jim is the founder and CEO of Spades Media. He's like as OG as it gets in the uh, Google ad space. He literally was one of the first 350 people on the platform. Since then, he's gone over to profitably spend over 280 million, mostly on Google ads. He's driven over a billion dollars in uh, e-commerce sales. Welcome to the robust marketer today, Jim. How you doing? I'm doing really well. And just, just for the benefit of anyone listening in, I do have actually a British accent. There's no sort of problem with the audio. This is genuinely how I sound. Nice. And, and my O's and U's are very Canadian. Uh, so <laughs> I, I have a, a very a very thick Ontario accent, I've, I've been told. So it, it's funny, actually, understand. you mentioned the chandelier bar. I mean, I've, been com I've become completely synonymous with this chandelier bar. Everyone goes, I, I walk through there and I, they expect to see me sitting there. And for a guy that like lives just outside of London, for them to kind of walk through the chandelier, are expected to see me. I've clearly done my, um, I've done, I've either done remarketing really well, or uh, I've just spent a, a crap ton of money there. One of, one of, one or other or both. So, it's it's not a bad thing to have attached to your name. It's a great bar. They have that one signature drink there, that verbena drink. Verbena, that, that, yeah. I don't know if you've ever had that. That is, it's I have. Your, your sweet and sour sensors for a minute. It's quite a quite an experience. Uh, nice. Well, welcome to the show today. You, uh, you know, obviously we brought you on because of your incredible Google ads expertise, but why don't, you know, you've, you've had such a, a, a long, you know, you had a, a, quite a journey in this space. So start us off with your marketers heroes journey. Tell us how you got, how you started and how you got to where you are today. Well, but funny enough, I, I actually celebrated yesterday was my 20th anniversary of working in digital marketing. Um, and I did a two hour uh, YouTube video, like I uh, did, did my first ever YouTube live. Um, basically talking about like some of the things from kind of way back then. So, I mean, I started um, buying media. I mean, I, I worked for a web design company um, and it was a bit like, you know, Emperor's New Clothes. It was like all new. Nobody really knew what was going on. Um, 
So I think a lot of people were like uh, coming in, getting websites. They, they said, oh, I want to have a website built. And, and then it would be like, well, what do we do now? And we're like, uh, well, you need to do some marketing. Well, what is marketing? Right. So I spent a lot of time just trying to research and understand what was going on. And I came across this platform. It's called GoTo. Um, and GoTo was the kind of the predecessor of um, Overture, which was the predecessor of Yahoo, which really, I guess, it's the predecessor of Bing, the predecessor of, of Microsoft. That, that's kind of how that ecosystem has evolved. Um, so we were, we were buying traffic on, um, on uh, GoTo. And at the time, the, the traffic was all sort of like uh, basically a penny a click, right? So, you know, for us, it was a case of, you know, it was absolutely manner from heaven. We, we were able to, um, to kind of generate fantastic results for for peanuts, but and, and really back then it wasn't a, a anywhere near as competitive as it is now. Um, so you know, we we, we kind of um, I, I did that. I worked for six months working for a dot com startup. Uh, got basically like they ran out of money, so I went to work for another dot com startup. They ran out of money. I went to work for another dot com startup. They ran out of money. And I thought to myself, I'm beginning to see a bit of a pattern here, right? So I decided after the third time of being laid off. Uh, that what I would do is I would take my life into my own hands and, and actually set up my own agency. So, um, you know, at the time we were sort of sitting, trying to think of what the, the company should be called. And at the time, everything was all uh, alphabetical. So, you know, we we're trying to think of, should we call ourselves Aardvark or whatever it, were, whatever it would be. So we ended up with a company called Web Diversity, which starts with a W. So we were like much, much further down in the uh, the directories than we should have been. Um, so, you know, we, we, we really kind of stuck our teeth into um, buying traffic. So um, at that time, Google didn't even exist. Um, so when Google kind of launched the platform, the first the first uh, day that, that kind of Google launched their, um, their Google Ads platform, um, they were selling traffic on a CPM basis, right? Now, again, I don't really think at the time, because Google are an engineering company, I don't really think at the time they understood how valuable what they had was. So they were selling traffic for Again, I think in all the campaigns I've run over all those years, I've never, ever matched the performance of the campaign that I ran the first time around on Google. I think it was probably, I think, employee number eight or something like that that actually said to um, to Sergey and Larry, you know what, we should be charging for clicks rather than for, like, impressions, right? Because they, they were basically just charging for impressions, and the performance was just off the scale. So so for us, it was a case of, you know, we, we wanted to um, to try and, see what we could do to um, to kind of do that. So when, so when Google uh, first launched here in the UK, um, they had like a small serviced office. It probably looked a little bit like where you're sitting now, right? So it was like a room, probably no no windows, um, yeah. you know, two people just in the basement. And they pleaded with me to spend money uh, with them through their agency program that they'd set up. So uh, I think we were the second agency that signed up with Google. Um, I grew that agency to 25 people. Uh, we were spending probably four to six million dollars a month. Actually, we had a four million dollar a month line of credit with Google, uh, and we were spending again like a, an insane amount of money. Uh, we probably had um, like twenty five staff. We were doing about eight eight million pounds a year in revenue, um, and I sold the business in two thousand six. And, and funny enough, at, at the time I, I kind of sold it, I was looking at floating the business or merging with other companies, and I just thought, you know what? I'm going to go down the route of um, selling it to a publicly traded company. Um, and no sooner I'd have sold the company that the, uh, the company I sold it to, they went into some some real sort of difficult periods. So, I mean, for me, it was like a bit of a baptism of fire. I did a bit yeah, of a you, and you'd been through that experience uh, previously with your other jobs of taking <laughs> exactly. some money and, and, and then having the company have a change of fortune. Uh, and yeah, it seems like it was a very common thing back in the day. But when it come, when it came to actually... You know, I, so I cut my teeth on Google AdWords as well. So I, around 2007, started advertising. You know, I was working for an affiliate network, so I was doing ringtones and toolbars and all of these kinds of things. And it was a really uh, a really interesting platform to work on. And back in the day, because you not only had less competition, you also had this thing where people were just sort of like happy that, or it was like a novel, oh, I lost you here. But I'll continue my, my talk. It was basically like a, a novel notion that ads were even talking to you. Uh, and you find this a little bit in, uh, especially I think when you're advertising in other countries, perhaps. I lost you there for a minute there, Jim. Um, oh, your sound is gone. Um, how did that happen? So do whatever you did last time that got you, uh, that got your sound working. Um, but yeah, so AdWords, again, well, while I think I'm oh, back. There we go. He's sorry. back. Sorry. Sorry, uh, sorry, I was sorry. Just, 
I was no worries. I was just saying that uh, you have, you know, you uh, in back in the day, you had the factor of like, uh, you know, it was a uh, less competition, but it's also it was novel for the users, even that they had ads that were speaking to them in any kind of personalized fashion. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm curious, like back in the day when you were doing those 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 big numbers, what, what kind of clients were you working with back then? Well, funny enough, I mean, I actually set up an agency as a bit of a smokescreen, right? I wanted to kind of run some of my own sites. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to use somebody else's money to do it, right? And back then, Google were offering uh, 30 day credit terms, right? So I thought, great, I can run kind of traffic and use Google's dime to pay for it. Um, you know, so a lot, a lot of the sites were sites of my own, right? So I was running a lot of affiliate stuff back then. And, uh, you know, we, we were doing ringtones, payday loans, a lot of insurance, travel, um, you know, again, like a, a lot of um, like high street retailers. I mean, at one point in time, I don't know, um, we, we call them bespoke shirts, right? So basically custom made shirts, right? And at one point in time, there's a, there's a street here in the UK called German Street. And basically we, we had every single company that worked on German Street that made custom shirts as clients. So we, we were, we were and, and again, I think, I think it's really, you know, we were trying to get over the, the kind of the hurdle of, um, you know, people were skeptical about the, the, you know, the performance and everything else. And we, we just said, look, you know, why don't you just throw a little bit of money at it, see how it performs. And the performance was just, again, like you look at some of the, the results people show now, back then we were, we were spending, you know, peanuts and making tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of pounds a month for, for some of the clients that we were working with, you know, and, um, and yeah, I mean, I think, I think a lot of them, they, they were skeptical and then they converted very, very quickly and threw a lot more at it. Um, very interesting. And that, and I bet I have, I have so many friends doing the agency game now, and I bet it must've been really difficult back then to see these incredible fortunes, you know, you were making for these clients. Uh, and getting paid on the spend, which was you know much lower at the time. It's a good thing that you had your own you know affiliate sites and your own your own sort of like you're you're reaping the whirlwind on the side. Well, like. I mean, what was really interesting, Eric, is that that when Google first launched, right, they were trying to steal money from TV, radio, and print, right, and that was traditional above the line media. And what typically happened was anyone that bought TV, radio, or print, they were as an agency, they were used to getting a fifteen percent discount, right, so. What Google were doing is if we bought $100 worth of traffic from Google, right, we only paid 85, right? So we were getting a 15% discount and we were also charging our clients a 15% override at the time. I mean, I hate the, the percentage of spend model now, right? But that's only with the benefits of hindsight. At the time, that was kind of like the, the only, really the only game in town. Everyone did it, um, you know. So again, we were making probably 30% margin right on um on the traffic that, that we were buying and i mean although it wasn't as competitive as it is now and the, the cpcs were not not as big as they are now i mean we still had in some certainly in, in some verticals like insurance i mean you know we had clients that were spending two three hundred thousand pounds a month on traffic so we were we were kind of making probably 80 to 100 grand a month in um in fees right for uh, for managing that account and i mean we didn't have you know, probably had one and a half people actually managing those sorts of accounts, right? So, so again, it was it's very lucrative, very profitable. Um, again, I was able to kind of reinvest a lot of the money into other projects of mine, but also into uh, more people. You know, again, we, we never kind of had to raise any any money, or we did had to never had any debt. We we just kind of ran the business. It's very profitable, very lucrative. So nice well, and a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Yeah. I can imagine. So let's talk about the way Google ads, because Google, you know, I was involved with Google ads back in the day, you know, and then, and then moved on to, I moved to other platforms, other sexier platforms kind of thing, because there was a bit of period there where, where I think so many people just flooded into, into Facebook. And, and I think there's a real renaissance happening now where people are really realizing the benefits of, uh, of, of really mo like, you know, there's two ways to look at Google. There's, you know, there's obviously there's brand protection, basic stuff. And then there's, there's, there's ways that you can like really scale it and really think about it in a different way. Can you talk a little bit about how Google ads has evolved over the years and why you decided to really double down on it throughout your career and really stick with it? Yeah. So I, I think, I think again, I mean, like, I, I guess because I, I, I was involved in the very early stages, sold a business in 2006. I then set up a, basically an affiliate network, which I sold, but I, I became very, very, aware of all of the, the kind of the tradings of, of companies that people were buying and why they were buying them and things like that, right? So again, if you look at, um, you know, some of the, the, again, talk very briefly about Facebook, they bought Instagram and everyone was like, a billion dollars for an 11 person company, they're insane, right? And anyone goes, look, you look back now and go, that was like, you know, absolutely magical for them to do that, right? 
uh, you know, again, you look at Google, Google bought YouTube, right? And they bought YouTube, I think, for 1.65 billion or something like that, right? And again, at the time, it was just like insane. But you look at what all that YouTube is now is just, again, it's phenomenal. It's, it's a massive search engine. But again, so much of the content that's being consumed now by users is being consumed on mobile, right? And 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 obviously, video is is part of that 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 kind of evolution. You know, they, it, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and they bought... Um, they bought they bought a couple a company um, you know basically they bought a company called Performix DoubleClick like many many years ago and that that has obviously evolved into their kind of ad exchange product right so you know so again Google have made like some really good strategic acquisitions um, they bought a company called Adometry quite recently um, and that's their attribution platform right so again they, they've they've been really good in if they don't have in their ecosystem, what they need to kind of pull everything together, they've gone out and acquired a, a strategic company that fits a kind of hole in their in their portfolio, right? So I think for, for me, it's, it's really just a case of, you know, that, that there was a kind of a period of time when, you know, clearly the, the public or the user base had gone mobile, but the, the kind of the sites hadn't really kind of adopted it, right? So they were still looking at pure Direct response, you know, I spent a hundred dollars. How much did I make? I only made eighty. Right. Well, let's let's stop buying traffic because it's not working. Rather than actually looking at it from the point of view of, you know, assisted conversions and stuff like that. So I think when you when you look at it now, you know, that there's a lot more uh, multiple multiple touch point journeys that take place. Google has their finger in a lot of those kind of pies, the ecosystem, right? And but you also see people they'll fi fire off to to kind of uh, Facebook. They'll fire off to um, you know to 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 Microsoft properties that, that may exist, and then they might come back to Google. And really, you want to make sure that wherever wherever people are searching for whatever reason, right, that you're in 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 the sort of the the, the, the place to actually provide them with some some form of a solution, right? And again, if you look at it now, a lot of the journeys they may start with like a generic search. Uh, they then people will then start to like look for reviews and and you know product ratings and that sort of thing, and then ultimately they they might come back and they'll they'll uh, ping, ping off a, a kind of a, a brand search and they'll see on certainly on desktop they might see like um, product product listings on the side of the page or at the top right so again Google have evolved their their proposition right so again it used to be you'd had paid ads at the top paid ads down the side and they were all text right now they've kind of evolved it so that there's there's a, not an awful lot of um, organic real estate left on Google right it's primarily paid right and I think you know for, for me it's, it's very much, although it's 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 still primarily keyword driven. There is, you know, they're moving away from exact match terms to to much more, um, you know, broad match like voice search kind of kicks in there. This again, there's so, there's so much kind of um, there's so many moving parts to the Google ecosystem that try to kind of keep on top of it. I mean, for me, that's that's one of the things I really enjoy is that there are lots and lots of moving parts to it, right? And you know, they come out with. A lot of stuff to do with machine learning and AI, and you know they, they come out with what they call smart campaigns, right? They're really smart campaigns are really just you know a, a clever way of trying to get people to pay more money. And for me as an agency now, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to you know adopt the smart things that actually do work, and 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 kind of call bullshit on the things that don't work. Because you know, I'm interested in that because I you know I'm working with Google a lot back in the day and then picking it back up to to market these events which which is which I've been doing. Um, I, I you know I think all media platforms are at, at their heart they're a little bit of a I should put this delicately fuck you platforms where they're trying that they will spend as much of your money as they can within the terms of of, of what and I, I found that all the time that there was unless you were very careful about. You know, uh, you know, cutting down, you know, controlling exactly where the spend goes. You know, our our audience is worldwide. We have this. We run these worldwide events, and so yeah. that's always a challenge in whatever platform I run is making sure that we're really controlling uh, where you know where the money is being spent, essentially. Um, and I, I found that with Google, that there's a, if you don't have the toggles just right, they'll 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 spend as much as as, the, as they can. Well, well, that's the whole point. Is out of the box, right? Google are horrible for advertisers but great for themselves. I mean, I'm not saying that if, again, let, 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 let me put it into context. I'm not saying that if you're a brand spanking new advertiser, never advertised with Google before, that you couldn't spend money and make money, right? Yeah. But the reality of it is, is that you could probably make, you know, five times as much money if you had the settings right from, you know, so again, working with an expert who understands what's what sort of things to switch on, what sort of things to switch off, what sort of things never to include, 
right? What sort of things to always include? Um, you know, and again, just just how the the whole Google ecosystem works, right? Because again, it's it's a it's a very very complex ecosystem. You know, again, you you've got um, you know some people that like like Tom Breeze, who I think is is going to be at the event. I mean, he's a, he's a YouTube video genius, right? Absolutely fantastic in terms of YouTube advertising. That's all they do, right? They just buy YouTube advertising, and they're very very good at it, right? But again, if you, if you look at the way kind of that that the whole YouTube thing works, is you know. YouTube is phenomenal for remarketing, but again, that like you see people when when we order accounts, we we tend to find there's a lot of pieces missing of the puzzle, right? So you know, like they don't make it easy for you to be able to say, here's my analytics account, plug that in. Here's my Google Ads account, plug that in, right? I want to run some ads on YouTube, you know, I want to be able to plug that in, right? Again, like I I, I spoke to um, a Google rep and they were like, oh, you know, we don't we don't really have the the kind of um, the tracking of conversions dialed in on YouTube as well. So if you're running YouTube in the same account as you're running Google search, you're not going to have the um, the kind of the results that you want. That is, uh, yeah, that's interesting there. I just switched off my... Nice. You touched on it there a little bit. I really liked when you were talking about the, the, how Google has evolved their products to really sort of give you a more three-dimensional view of the customer journey. And I feel like that's that's one of the key differences. I think you can you obviously want to be able to in whatever whatever marketing you're doing, you want to be able to speak dynamically to where people are in the buying cycle. But I feel like, like Google specifically, because of its it's based on intent, gives you that opportunity more than other platforms, especially with the Facebook. Yeah, because I, I, again, if if you look at the way Facebook works, like if you're if you're running ads on Facebook, you're interrupting the reason why people are there, right? So yeah. people are there to you know watch videos and you know leave comments on their friends friends post and then there's an ad appears right whereas google they've specifically gone there and they have you know a, a, a specific problem that they're trying to solve or you know a place that they need to be or something like that right and google can help solve those problems with the ecosystem that they have right and, and obviously they've got their own kind of owned and operated properties right and then they also have their their kind of uh, the partners that they work with right so they'll they'll work with you know the bbc again it's it's really interesting like um you know like the bbc in the uk is is all funded by a license fee but outside of the uk it's funded by advertising right so anyone that goes abroad will see ads that, that you know on the, the bbc which ultimately are, are powered by google right so google have built the uh, the architecture to enable publishers to make money from the sites that they have, right? And Google make a, a commission on on whatever's sort of being served up, right? But again, I think when you look at it, that whole ecosystem has changed a lot, right? Because it used to be Google would keep say forty percent of the um, the revenue, pay sixty percent to the publisher, right? A lot of the publishers now are going, you know what? I can kind of do my own deals privately, right? And sell my inventory uh, separately. So they're actually taking their inventory out of Google. And selling it on you know DSPs and exchanges and what you see on Google is the kind of the stuff that they haven't been able to sell at a premium level right so in in some respects although there's still an absolutely boatload of um, traffic available on the Google display network a lot of the good traffic has gone by the time it actually arrives at the Google display network so and again we, we we've tried to um to understand where those buys are and again a lot a lot of it would be you know, we'll, we'll try and identify a publisher on the Google Display Network that we get good results from, right? And then we'll kind of work our way up the funnel into the exchanges and through the DSPs to try and find more of the inventory at a more of a premium position and, and um, you know, a better maybe private, privately negotiated rate, so. Do you ever circumvent the exchanges entirely uh, and just go, like this is something that Alex Brown talked a little bit about in uh, in his speech in, in Las Vegas, was actually doing direct site buys and he didn't seem to be going through the, the, the displays in the traditional sense. Do you ever go like totally circumvent them? And I guess there's header bidding in there as well now, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, head, header bidding is, is, again, I mean, I think that that's come about, I think a lot because of the e ecosystem that Google has built, right? So Google have been involved in every single impression that's served, like, and, and again, I think a lot of publishers are kind of uncomfortable with that, right? So they're trying to kind of take more of their control and have the opportunity to sell their own inventory before Google actually sells it on, right? So I think, um, you know, you're, you're seeing more in that, that head of bidding things. But again, I mean, like, so on the DSP that we use, we use um, a platform called Centro, um, you know, we, we have like a full kind of uh, media buying platform so we can, 
you know, negotiate deals and do private deals. So again, if there's a particular site that we want to uh, to kind of buy a private placement from, we say we want to buy a million impressions from, you want to pay five bucks CPM, um, you know, and, and we want to buy these hours on, you know, again, it's, it's, it's almost like all of the things that people used to get from Facebook, it's still available, but outside of the Facebook ecosystem, so. Interesting. But it's okay. Let's talk. So I think a lot of our audience are are they're building agencies or they're building e-com companies. I feel like that's a big uh, or they're saying they're building an agency and they're running affiliate stuff like a lot of affiliates and agencies do. It's so I, I think somebody came up with a, a coined a, a really cool phrase. I think it's called they called consultancies, right? So they're consultant agencies, right? So it's not really an agency in the traditional sense, but it's more I like, like that. a consultative agency. I'm, I love portmanteau, so I'm going to start a consultancy <laughs> as well. Um, but okay, so so say you're you, you've got a new client or a new product who comes to you. It's an e, it's an ecom product. What is the process you go through uh, in terms of uh, finding out how you're going to build a scalable campaign for that product? Describe the sort of overview of the process. Okay, so I mean, for for us as an agency, I mean, we probably get approached by, you know, for every ten companies that approach us. Uh, we might only decide to work with one or two of them, right? And okay. and part of the reason for that is, you know, again, I, I think for us, we, we want to make sure that if we're going to kind of take on a client, that we want to make sure that, um, you know, there's demand for what it is that they're they're selling, um, that there is, you know, they've, they've got a, a kind of a reasonable proposition, right? Because again, it's, it's, it is difficult. I mean, you know, a lot of people go, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to do drop shipping. I'm going to do, you know, buy some stuff from China and I want to kind of run it through Google and whatever else. And I just, again, I think I, I think you, you've got to look at it, which, whether you're buying traffic from Google, by, from Facebook, anywhere, right? If you've got like a lousy product and a lousy website, you're going to get poor results, right? I mean, it's not, Facebook is, and Google are not a magic wand, right? You've got to have good, good, good product, good process, good people, good customer service, right? And if all of those things are in play, Right then, I think you've got a, a, a reasonably good chance of succeeding. Right. So again, what we what we tend to look for is we'll look for because you know, because most of the success that you'll have probably eighty percent of the success will come from stuff that you do yourself, and the other twenty percent will come from you know stuff that your competitors do. Right. I mean, again, like back way back in the in, in the early days, you know, we used to go toe to toe with Amazon. Right. And and people were like, well, how could you possibly take on Amazon? Right. And and again, we basically spent the time understanding what their buying behavior was right in the auctions and and what we tend to find is that it, we found that amazon actually ran out of money right usually around about the 20th of the month right so they they would go hard really really hard right from the beginning of the month and around about the 20th they would just run out of cash right as in like they probably had like 50 million to spend in the month and they'd spend 50 million by the 20th of the month and then they would just disappear right so for the last 10 days of the month Amazon were not involved in those those bids auctions that were taking place. So we could just go in and clean up. So we basically understood that that's what their behavior was, right? So we made sure that we we kind of reverse engineered our strategy so that we picked up all the, the, the opportunities that existed at the end of the month. Interesting. Okay, cool. So when, when it comes to how do you go about, so let's take a product. So it's a, I don't know if it, it's a question it, actually, but you didn't actually, you, yeah, you, yeah, okay. you didn't give your, yeah, I, I'm trying to dig for your like process. A politician, like, right? A little <laughs> bit, a little slippery. So when it comes to, yeah, actually like generating, like what, how do you think about building campaigns? So obviously there's, 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 is it similar to Facebook where there's prospecting uh, and remarketing essentially there's sort of brand protection, prospecting, remarketing, like how do you break down campaigns? Yeah, so we we typically would, would start. I mean, again, like like there there'll be some some slam dunky type things that you can do, right? So again, like like a, a lot of the the big success we'll have will come from branded terms, right? So if you're working with a company, you know, and they're a reasonable brand, they spent a decent amount of money over the years uh, building their brand, whether it's either above the line or whatever, right? They're going to get right incredibly cheap traffic that's going to convert incredibly well. Yeah. So so for us, I mean, we we put branded search in to kind of begin with and the reason that some people that this, this big argument between uh paid search aficionados and they say well why would i bid on my own brand when i already rank for it organically right the reason that you, you bid on your own brand is one you could test test different versions of your home page without jeopardizing your organic results you can add like a lot of site links in so you can have lots of different jump off points you can actually route the traffic to a completely separate 
user experience. So if you wanted to um, to send them directly to um, you know to a landing page offering a, a new product that you've kind of brought in, you can use your brand terms to actually you know basically see the new product that you have going into the market, right? So uh, so and, and so for us, it's it's very much a case of we start with the brand, right? Then we look at generic. We'll look at um, you know and it, and again. What, what we try and find is that there'll be some keywords that the particular company will want to be synonymous with, right? So in a lot of cases, like I used to work for a travel company called Cheap Flights, right? And and there was probably 20,000 searches a day for the term Cheap Flights in the UK, right? Now, we wanted to be number one, right? And, and we basically lost a ton of money buying that keyword because it wasn't profitable to, to buy such a generic keyword, right? And make it kind of back out on the bottom line, right? But because we had loss leading stuff, we, we were loss leading those terms with some of the stuff that we were making huge money on. So like the branded terms that, that were, you know, like chieflights.co.uk, which was like specifically our brand, right? Those those clicks would be, you know, pennies, but we would make really good money from them. So we used to kind of offset the loss that we would make on the, uh, the you know, the, the synonymous generic terms with the profit that we made somewhere else, right? So for us, it was always, we were always trying to, to work on a blended performance, right? So we don't tend to look at one channel in isolation, right? We look at all of the channels, kind of how they feed into the ecosystem overall, right? So again, as, a, as an example, so you'd expect your brand performance to always be double digit. You'd expect your generic performance to maybe be, you know, two to f- two to 4%. Uh, shopping, again, you'd expect shopping to probably be double digit, right? In most cases, remarketing, double digit. Um, display, probably, half a percent if you're lucky conversion right but again that feeds into all of the other things that kind of go on right so you tend to find that there's a lot of um good value that will be passed from display campaigns out into other campaigns so if you only look at display as a pure direct response profitable channel you know people again people just go oh switch i switched display off it wasn't working for me and that's completely the wrong thing to do you know because display will like i said it'll it'll funnel and fuel loads of other things that that um that you have going on that's interesting and are you uh, and that's probably and that's a display with the right toggles in place yeah, so yeah it doesn't yeah so it doesn't blow it doesn't blow it out but do you actually have uh, so i'm actually not familiar with google's assisted conversions and and sort of how do you are you actually are you doing this based on like on general senses of when this happened this went up or is there literally like assisted conversions that get oh, attributed yeah. to, there's, yeah. there's assisted conversions that you you would have and again again you know with, Obviously, with Facebook, you have your attribution models, the 28 day and one day kind of clicks and views and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, and, and Google has the same sort of thing. Right. So you can you can do um, convert could like um, attribution models where you can look at things on a linear basis. You can look at first click, last click. And a lot of the, the kind of the configuration set up. Right. Will really depend. So like as an example. So, again, if I go into an account and I see that they've got their conversions as the they've imported their Google Analytics data as their conversions, right, then they're not they're not using Google Ads properly because Google Ads has a completely different um, way in which they actually do the um, the attribution. Right? So um, so to so Google will, will always give credit to the last non direct conversion that, t- that took place. Right. So with analytics, you, you, your conversion will be whatever, whatever day that the kind of conversion took place, that's when it will show in analytics. With Google Ads, it'll track it back to the last non-direct. So you might have, so let's say you have a branded term today, shopping today, uh, shopping in two days time, right? And then a direct kind of conversion, it'll basically give the credit to the shopping, right? But not to the brand. Whereas analytics will give it to the direct because that's that's effectively when the conversion took place. So. If you don't get your um your tracking right f- from that perspective, you'll you'll be in trouble. So that's interesting. No, there's no I've way lost, to track. I've lost the sound again, Eric. Unfortunately. Oh, 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 you've lost my sound. Yeah. Check, check, check. Hey, audience, can you hear me? We we've got a few comments here. Uh, I look like I'm in a server room. Yeah, I am in the meeting room here in, at the Helmkin offices, and uh, it does. I do have a giant electrical grid behind me. Yes, that is true. Uh, people love uh, Jim Banks here. We'll listen to this interview later. Love hearing from Jim Banks. Then Carrie Hartman, one of my favorites, says, hashtag BW, BDWJB, GDWJB. I don't know what those mean. Maybe Carrie can uh, clarify. 
So B B D W J B is bad decisions with Jim Banks. Bad decisions with Jim Banks. And they usually involve the chandelier bar and um and alcohol. Hold on, I must plug in here. I have two, I thought I could wait without a plug, but I'm not, I'll be right back. Did we? <laughs> okay, this, we're good. a few kinks in this uh, this week's Robots Marketer. Um, but nice, so I wanna thank everyone for sticking with us uh, while we go through this. Yeah, Vegas is always an amazing thing. So if you wanna catch Jim, uh, get into more detail on his process and what to expect uh, in the future, which we'll actually talk a little bit just after this with, with Google Ads. you got to come to Barcelona. It's going to be an incredible show, another two-day event. We're just finalizing the venue this week, and so we'll be announcing that soon for everyone. Uh, but we'd love people from the Ad Buyers Group to come on out. Uh, we uh, It's always an amazing show. We had over 400 people at our event last year in Barcelona, so we're anticipating tickets, the remaining tickets to go fast. We're, we're already halfway sold out, and, uh, and I absolutely can't wait for it. Barcelona is one of my favorite cities in the world. Uh, I imagine you've been there as a, as a European uh, there, Jim? Yeah, I've been there a few times. I love it. It's a great place. That's fantastic. Okay. Uh, we've got a few questions here. Why don't we, ju why don't we jump into that? We've got... Uh, cool. Uh, what are the biggest mistakes that beginners make with Google Ads? Um, so, so I think the, 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 one of the, the one thing I see all the time is people like, and I don't mean this, in, I don't trust them, but it's like people trust Google implicitly, right? So they will say, if Google says, you need to bid $4.50 to show, people will bid $4.50 to show, right? So that, you know, they, they obviously force you to kind of like increase your bids when the reality of it, again, like unlike a lot of people where, you know, they, they like, again, we talk to, to people in the Facebook ad buyers group, they go, I'm going to do Facebook. You kind of start low and then you work, you work your way down. Like sometimes with Google, I mean, certainly in the display network traffic, you know, we, we kind of walk, we call it walking the plank, right? So we basically walk our bids up like a penny or two pennies at a time until we get to the point where, you know, we really start to get some traction, right? Because, you know, it is like a fire hose, literally. Like if you, you could bid seven cents and get nothing, and then you could bid like nine cents and get flooded with like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of visits in like no time at all, right? So it's literally just finding that tipping point, right? In, in every single auction that you have. So I think, again, a lot of it is don't trust implicitly what Google say, right? Because you know, because Google's objective as a publicly traded company is to make money for their shareholders, right, and to make a profit, right. And if you make some money in, as a as a byproduct of that, fantastic. But you know, that's not what their objective is, right. I would stay really far or as far away as possible from campaigns that involve a mixture. So you you mentioned at the beginning here that um, that you you run your campaigns globally, right. So again, the value of visitors in certain countries is much much higher than in others. Right. And if you have a campaign that's targeting the whole world, then basically you're overpaying for some of the visitors and probably underpaying for others. Right. So what you need to do is try and find that sweet spot. So we, we kind of really look at them as sort of tier one and tier two. So the tier one would be your English language speaking countries, the US, UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, um, you know, probably France, Germany. Um, and then your tier twos would, would be sort of countries where you know, like Philippines and Indonesia, you know, big populations, but not necessarily holding as much money to kind of spend on acquisitions that you might Shout want. Shout out to all my friends in Nepal. <laughs> we, we, we have a lot of Nepalese that found their way onto our remarketing pixel. So uh, and Facebook, we, we, we end up, yeah. So I, this is, yeah, the, the international battle, we, we've definitely gone through a very, com you know, a very tiered system of making sure that we're only hitting hitting the right audiences. It's it's interesting with Facebook. Sometimes the worldwide ones, the, the, like it's it's always a balance because if you can find a way, like so sometimes the wider you can open up a campaign, the better it will work as long as you do have the right release valves or the right the right sort of like yeah. stop it. Stop and, loss and, and again, I I always say like if you put a sensible daily budget in place, right, 
again, I mean, even even then, you still could get into trouble, but not nowhere near as bad, right? So again, like the way, the, the biggest thing I always see people go, I set a daily budget at $100 and, and Google spent $400 today, right? So how can they do that when my budget was 100, right? And the way the daily budgets work in Google is they will not spend more than 30 times your daily budget in a month, right? So if you if you said, right, my budget's $100 a day, they will not spend more than $3,000 in a month, right? Okay. But if they spend 400 in one day, right, and you then change your budget, right, that kind of resets the clock. So you you kind of lost that opportunity. So, so the thing to do is to say, okay, well, realistically, if you can afford, let's say $500 a day, 15 grand a month, right? then keep it at that, right? Don't don't make so many changes. I mean, I, I think the, the, the beauty of Google is once you get it dialed in, right, you can pretty be, be pretty sure of consistency of performance over time, right? So again, we don't have this kind of, I've got to put up some new ads and everything else because my, my ads have gone to, to, to shit, right? You, you, you know, it just doesn't happen that way. Once you've got things like dialed in, locked in, right, performing at the level that you want, giving you the ROI that you want, right? You can pretty much say with some degree of consistency, apart from the fluctuations of day parting, you know, like certain days of the week and certain times of the day, you know, there'll be a consistency to, to the way in which the, the performance actually, um, you know, pans out. Nice. But, but I, again, I just think it's it's one of those, you know, d don't don't try to force the issue as much as, much as I, I want everyone to make money. Don't try and force it because if you try and force it, you just, you just won't kind of succeed. You, you can't go in and bully right you can't bully facebook it just doesn't work that way yeah uh google you mean yeah sorry google yeah exactly i like you, the can, kind of you how can bully facebook but you can bully facebook as we know and i like that you particularly have, if you're tim you've got to well you've got to really get into that space with your plank you gotta what well, you know you gotta the plank method the walk the plank method you can formalize that <laughs> in Barcelona. Uh, a few other things here how and this is this is something that goes back to you know, my biggest success is Google Ads back in the day were on these e-card download sites. Literally, we were running IAC toolbars, and I spun out Easter e-cards, Halloween e-cards, Thanksgiving e-cards. And this was back with, like, when the first big algorithm, well, one of the first big algorithm changes came, and we had to, oh, like, oh, you couldn't just be a landing page anymore. You needed to have content on the site. And so we were keyword stuffing. I was writing blogs about Mother's Day e-cards and things like that. It was it was super interesting. And, and But one of the things that we always, that we did very quickly was to use dynamic insertion in the ads, but then also use dynamic insertion to some extent from an ad group level to the landing page so that yeah. we were actually driving people, you know, that there was really consistent language through from the ad through to the landing page. So the question here, and I imagine it's still the same, but how important is consistent language between keyword ad and landing page? Yeah, I mean, I, again, like everything that we do on Google is all about the user, right? And, and for us, it's about a consistent kind of, um, you know, what they'll find what they what they're looking for when they get to where they arrive, where, where you put them, right? So again, it, it's got to be, you know, and and again, dynamic keyword insertion still works, right? But you also have like what they call ad customizers, right? And ad customizers, again, I'm going to cover some of that in Barcelona, but you know, it's a it's a cool way of being able to kind of differentiate based on location and and based upon device that people might be on, but also based upon the time of the month, right? So it used to be you'd have to create a hundred ads if you wanted to kind of um, you know cover all bases, right? And now you can actually use one ad, one ad customizer, and a, a kind of a data feed to actually populate that that um, that ad. So the ad will be much more um, bespoke for the people that are, are there. And when they actually get to the other end, like you know, again, if you if you've done good work in terms of the, the actual pages that you build, right, and you've got like you know the keyword in the title, keyword in the description, keyword as alt tags on images that you have. Right, that will help your quality score. If you have a better quality score, your your ads will be cheaper. Right, so you know there's, there's definitely still mileage in, in having that. But the one thing that was really interesting, I mean, we, I think we first started using dynamic keyword insertion, I think in 2002, right, when it when it first kind of launched, right, and and at the time it was just again a, a game changer at, at that particular point in time. But what became really apparent to us quite quickly was that no sooner had they brought it out, everyone was using it. Right, so what we found was that you know you had ten results on the page, and all ten of them would have dynamic keyword insertion. So they'd all say the same thing, right? So we actually got to the point where we pivoted, right, from from doing DKI to not doing DKI, right? So it's almost like then our ads stood out because they looked different, right? Because everyone else's was DKI and ours were not DKI. 
right? So that's funny. I was going over one of your old presentations, and and I it's hard to know because you, your presentations are great in that they have very little text on them, which yeah. is great for when you're actually presenting. You can tell you're a polished presenter, uh, but uh, but it was hard to, to glean. But the one thing is the zig. You you were you talked a lot about zigging when others zag, and that seems like yeah. a really great example. Of, of reading the marketplace and making sure that you're you're yeah you're in a good I, I, spot. I mean, again, like like you, I, I'm pretty sure that we must have invented. When I say we, my team, we must have invented probably eighty percent of all all the things that you would consider to be black hat PPC, right? So the things yeah. that were really kind of pushing the boundaries of like acceptable behavior, right? We we kind of probably invented most of those um, those things. And and again, I think certainly when I was running my affiliate network, I mean. A lot of what we had to do was try and keep one step ahead of the, the kind of affiliates that were going to try and game the system, right? So we needed yeah. to, to know what the system was to in, to enable us to kind of prevent people gaming it, right? So I think we, my team invented, uh, and we actually lost a Google account for it, but my team invented, we were running a lot of dating ads at the time, and we, we invent, I believe we invented the message banner, first of all, that you have this many messages banner. And then I think, and then we also invented it, well, as far as we were concerned, uh, adding it that into that message text, like you have this many messages as one of the, the lines in the text, and that yep. really, people did not like that. That was that was a, 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 a no no for, for for that one. So I yeah, I'm very familiar with that sort of that that gray hat race of just sort of just pushing up to the line as far as you can to get the desired performance. I mean, I mean, it, I mean it's funny. Like there's there's now some some tools out there that will do this brand monitoring, right? So again, if you're a brand, right, and you want to protect people bidding on your brand, right? Um, it used to be that there was there was no way of doing it, and then I think people like Brand Verity came out and stuff like that. Um, but back in the day, I mean, what we what we did was we would bid on on the brand terms, right? We would then phone the office. So we were an affiliate working with some of the biggest insurance companies here in the UK, right? So we phoned the office to find the person who was actually um, the person that was responsible for checking what, the ads to see whether anyone was bidding on the brand. Right. They would literally go to Google and type in their brand. And if there was anyone there, they would contact them. Right. So we found out when those person when that person was actually in the office. Right. So that we could switch the ads off when they were in the office and then switch them on when they were not in the office. Oh, right. <laughs> so That's then, a different kind of game, right? Yeah. And, and, and then we thought, well, this is silly that we keep having to switch the ads off. So eventually we worked out we actually went to their office asked to kind of go onto their um, Wi-Fi in the office, got their IP address, put the IP address into Google to enable us to basically block their IP from seeing the ad. So then we could run them 24 seven, right? So, oh. so again, it's, it's almost like it's a, an episode of 24, you know, we're kind of going in, cutting the black cables and, and just, you know, but again, like for, for us, it was important that, that we did that because we wanted to make sure we could capitalize on the opportunity for as long as it existed, so. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Okay, so a question here about Bing. Do you emulate your campaigns on Bing? And, and do you know about the changes that the Bing platform is going to announce uh, to switch to a Microsoft Ads platform? Have you heard any, anything about this? Yeah, so a couple, couple of really interesting things about Bing. So again, I, I'm, I've always been a huge fan of Bing, have, have been for years. Um, ever since they were, like I said, they were kind of go-to overture. Um, they then became Yahoo, then, Big, then Bing. Um, and then I think... Um, like a, a lot of people buy Yahoo Gemini. So again, I don't know if, if people that, that kind of buy media on Gemini have, have noticed, but uh, Gemini just doesn't exist anymore. And basically, yeah, yeah, Bing did a deal with um, Verizon Media so that all of the ads that that were being served on um, the, the kind of Yahoo Gemini platform are now being served through um, through basically this partnership that Verizon Media did with Bing. And then just recently, I think in the last day or so, um, Bing have made an announcement that they're going to be called Microsoft Advertising moving forward. Um, again, it, it was always kind of confusing. You had sort of Bing, Microsoft, Internet Explorer. You know, it, it, it was like a really complicated um, thing. But yeah, again, that's I, it. you could buy from for a while. Like it was called, yeah, yeah. But, but again, I think I think when you look at it, I mean, they quietly kind of amassed probably twenty seven percent market share in the US, that's right? Of all of the searches, high. yeah. And, and again, I think a lot of people go, well, what, what do they have? It's like, well, they've obviously got um, Windows. So Windows 10, by default, it has, um, you know, ad, ad results served by, by Bing, and obviously Microsoft now. Um, you had like Firefox, so that's all Bing. You've got Skype, that's all Bing. Um, 
what else is there there's a ps4 anyone that has a ps4 all the ads on there are from from bing right so there's there's a lot of there's a lot of traffic that they have and to answer the question you said about do we just mirror the accounts i mean what we do is to to, to kind of get things up and running on bing quickly what what we tend to do is we'll import the campaigns from google into bing right but that's just the starting point i mean from there we kind of uh, we do a lot of work to kind of get it so that it actually performs the right way so again we, we kind of set up the, the bing shopping feed um you know bing, bing have got their own i'm going to keep calling them bing for a while because they've only just changed to microsoft now. but um but yeah so they, they come up with um the um the, the basically the bing audience network right so they have the basically the, the sort of display network but for um you know for bing traffic and i think again i think that there's there's definitely still great opportunity but equally you know again if you look at um match type on bing i think the reason people don't get bing working properly right is that they don't use like um the right match type and again when when you start talking about synonyms right i mean bing really take the kind of you know they'll 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 say this is an apple and, and they'll call it a grapefruit right something completely different um with a completely different meaning so it's really important to kind of get those right you got to watch that Interesting. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, we're coming up on the end here. I'm just going to flash. So if you're looking to come to Barcelona, you can go to iStack.link uh, slash ad buyers right now. Uh, and we have tickets available. We have a, a price increase coming quickly. Uh, prices are going to be going up every couple of weeks until we, we go here. You're getting two full days of immersed intensive training on Facebook ads, Google ads, YouTube, Snapchat. Uh, you're going to walk out of this event a much improved ad buyer. You're going to meet incredible people. You're going to have total access to the speakers. I hope Jim's ready for mentorship hour uh, where we he, he saw how that works in uh, in San Diego, how the speakers just sort of get get a real opportunity to meet, meet a lot of people who have questions for them. Uh, what are you going to be bringing to the table uh, sort of specifically? What I, I don't think I, I don't know if you've written your presentation yet, but what is your presentation uh, going to be like in Barcelona? Um, well, again, the, the one thing I've always tried to do, Eric, I mean, I, I, I go to lots of conferences, speak at conferences all around the world. Um, and what I always try and do, I always try and make sure that, you know, I mean, people have taken like time out of their day. They've spent money, right, obviously to buy a ticket. They've had to buy a plane ticket. They've had to buy the ticket for the event. Right. It's a big investment. Right. And what I want to make sure is anyone that, eat, again, like if they just. If, if I was the only person on stage and nobody else was there and I talked for the, the length of time that I have, right, I'm pretty much guarantee that anyone that kind of takes the things that I give to them and takes them away and does something with them, they will get amazing kind of results from it, right? And, you know, again, anyone that's seen me speak before can kind of verify that, you know, I, I, I don't leave anything out, right? Because, again, I think a lot of it is, you know, it's the execution is, is the most important piece of it. It's not what it is, it's what you actually do with it, right? So again, I, I will give people, here's the keys, right? But it's entirely up to them to take those keys and actually, you know, turn them into, into money, right? So so for me, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't kind of hold anything back, right? But at the same time, I don't kind of gloss things up and say, this is a hack and this is a, you know, whatever. It's just like, you know. The, that, that's gonna solve all, you know, you know what I mean? It, it does yeah. all come down to execution for sure. Yeah. Again, there's nothing that I'm going to tell people that is not publicly available, right? But again, I've spent a, a crap ton of money, you know, and, and a lot of the things that we've done, we've made mistakes with, right? And because we made those mistakes, we know what not to do when it comes to putting things on board, right? So again, like, like um, you know, some of the, the new smart campaigns that Google have come out with, right? Some of them are good and some of them are great and some of them are absolutely appalling, right? And we tried them all, so we know which ones to kind of run and which ones not to run, right? And I'm going to be covering some of that in um, in Barcelona um, in some detail, right? Again, I, I don't know I don't know how much time I have to kind of speak on stage. I mean, I'm pretty sure I could talk for two days, but you know, but for me, it's it's a case of you know what I don't cover on stage, I'll cover in the kind of breakout sessions. And again, I've, I've always tried to make myself uh, really accessible to people. You know, anyone that see me in the group will know that um, that you know I try and answer as many questions as I can and. You know, I just I just love our industry. I want to make sure that um, it continues to evolve. You definitely have a lot of fans in this group. You've got a bunch of people calling you the man, which uh, is, is fantastic. <laughs> nice. uh, yes, if you want to learn from the man himself. Uh, you should come join us in Barcelona. We'll get into some trouble there as well. I've had some had some lovely evenings out at different absinthe bars in the, some of the 
the old parts of the town there. It is uh, a quite quite an amazing experience just sort of being there. Uh, what what is your travel schedule like these days? Like, are you are you traveling all over Europe, all over the world still? Uh, yeah, I'm off. I'm off to Australia in uh, two weeks' time. I'm going to Melbourne, then up to the Gold Coast, back to Melbourne. Um, then I'm back to the UK for a couple of weeks, and I'm out to Cyprus for a couple of weeks. I'm going to have a, a little bit of downtime because I used to have a house out there. Right? I, again, I don't know if I'll have time to tell the story on stage at uh, in Barcelona, but I I had a house in in um, in Cyprus which I built on the back of one keyword, right? And uh, yeah, I mean it, it, it's it's a, it's a, it's a a really funny story. You're going to catch Jim on stage in Barcelona and it's going to be fantastic. He's just one of 14 speakers. You know, Jim is going to, like he says, leave it all on stage. If you only saw Jim's presentation, uh, you would be, uh, you know, well-versed. You'd be able to walk away from the, from the trip uh, saying that you made your money's worth. Uh, and so we're going to be doing that times 14, 14 other speakers all doing the same thing. Uh, training you on advanced uh, marketing tactics, digital marketing tactics, and e-commerce strategies. So I cannot wait for Barcelona. I will see you all there. And for now, uh, we'll see you. Uh, oh, quick note too, I'm gonna be doing these twice a week now going forward with all the different speakers from Barcelona. So you're gonna get a good chance to get a preview of what we're bringing to the table. And I look forward to it. So I hope to see you guys back on these live streams. They're always the highlight of my week. Uh, so glad to be doing it again. Thanks for coming by again today, Jim. And uh, I guess we'll see you next in Barcelona. For sure. Looking forward to it. All right. Cheers.